Uh, Everybody must be like partying right now and must be tuning party. in drunk. <laughs> party. What's partying, man? It's work night. <laughs> With Saturday night? Yeah, it's Saturday night, right? It's Saturday morning for you, right? Yeah, so you there it must be Saturday night. So you guys like Saturday night till late you guys have to work? Even on Saturday? Yeah. <laughs> for me, uh, a young, young under two year old startup, what else you expect from for the founder? Oh no, no, I mean like startup is a different thing, but like general work environment. Uh most of the companies have Saturdays off, but uh, there are still a good mix of companies that are Saturdays working and then uh, people like us are sort of seven days. For working. me it's just I'll I can I can do how much work you want on a weekday. I can stay till late, but weekend is like one precious like time and it's like non negotiable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, totally understand. Cool, cool. So I, I think yeah, we can just kick off as well. So we have a bunch of folks in the chat, um, and and like I mentioned a little bit offline, that you know we'll have a mix of audience, folks who are trying to enter into the game industry, folks who are um, sort of maybe just started already. So so you can kind of keep the conversation from there. So yeah, All right, cool. So uh, hey everyone. Um, uh, I think most of you already know me, or at least have interacted with me in some shape or form. Um, so my Mike Desai, and I have Milind uh, on the call. Uh, Milind, thank you again for taking out the time. I know it's a early morning Saturday thing for you, and and so really appreciate you hopping on so early for your weekend as well. Um, and and we'll hopefully make this an interesting conversation. So. Uh, uh, before we dive into any kind of specific questions or anything, uh, you know, uh, guys, if you have any questions during the entire conversation, just put them in the chat, um, and you know, I'll keep picking up uh, questions as I move along. So uh, just feel free to drop the questions anytime, and and we'll just you know con keep continuing the conversation as well. Right? Cool. So Milan, uh, why don't you just sort of um give us a brief overview about how your journey has been so far what you have been up to and kind of you know just just introduce yourself to the audience as well uh hi everybody i'm milind i'm a game programmer at uh, niantic so my gaming background kind of journey begins five years ago uh, i would six years ago technically in my undergrad and until then i had no idea what i needed to do i was like most people out there like in until the third year of undergrad i had no idea what i was doing and kind of I, I was introduced to my gaming uh, society in my undergrad, uh, which is uh, Velour Institute of Technology, VIT. And I started kind of participating in both the development seminars as well as like the, the traditional gaming, like FIFA tournaments and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of introduced to how like gaming, I always associated game, game development as a concept, as a whole Western thing. It wasn't done in India much. And through that organization, I was introduced to kind of like how game development actually works in India. There are small hubs in Hyderabad, in Pune, etc., where you, there are actually game development done. And after that, I was kind of motivated to go down the game development route. And I researched various uh, universities which uh, offer programs in game development, like uh, there's RIT, there's USC, there's CMU. I fortunately got into CMU, which is I think even Mayank is an alumni of, and yep. uh, so that CMU actually was kind of taking me from like a small environment to like how proper, how brutal game development can be like deadlines and associating like how much time you can allocate for different tasks and you have to handle them properly. Otherwise everything can become a big mess. Yeah. So. I would say CMU was where uh, I also got a lot of networking done, a lot of, mm. got to meet a lot of different people in the industry. I actually, there was this one time when I had an office hours with uh, the CTO of uh, Treyarch, who make the Call of Duty games. Mm. And the CTO had actually come along with his lead programmer and they were like, uh, basically taking programmers, resumes, taking their GitHub and just checking them out. So it was kind of an insane feeling like having like a, professional game developer right there looking at your code on GitHub. So that was pretty crazy. And uh, then my first technically job in the game uh, industry was uh, during my internship. And I interned uh, under the CMU physics department and I made like a physics based game for them. Mm -hmm. And 
my first proper uh, development experience in like a game company was during my co-op which is a semester long internship which many universities offer and during that time i actually was technically like the lead of the project and i got to make like different prototypes so that is one thing which i found very useful is when you put your hands in different jars try to experiment with different features and different mm-hmm. prototypes and that kind of widens your horizon to different things out there mm-hmm. and and then i graduated and i joined seismic which is a game company based in uh, los angeles and they've made games like uh, blade runner vr which is a, a vr experience mm-hmm. for the uh, oculus uh, rift and also we have had uh, various uh, acquisitions so we got acquired by niantic so technically actually i saw in the introduction that i'm sf i'm in sf actually i'm in la because mm-hmm. i'm in niantic la which is a sub group of niantic and we have different offices all over the us and in japan as well and that's pretty much been my experience i have been working at niantic for over 2 years and as seismic 3 years and uh yeah i've been working I, my game which i'm working on is uh, magic the gathering it's been announced so it's about to ship in a month mm-hmm. so we are in that stage of polish where it's headache <laughs> nice 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 I, i actually didn't know that you guys were working on magic um so yeah so uh, the thing is uh my project which i'm working on is a seismic project like it predates our acquisition by niantic so okay. so it's actually a seismic game it's been announced and we are working with wizards of the coast which is hmm. associated with magic and dragons hmm. like hmm. okay i think this is the first adaptation of magic in some digital format i think uh, so far magic has... arena was reached beta but i don't think so they have added like, they yeah. have no launched it yeah I, i don't think they ever launched anything publicly so so that's why i was like yeah, yeah, this is a big deal right so so for folks uh, who might not be into card games uh, so magic if you might have heard of hearthstone and then a lot of the other games that came along right uh, popularizing this card game genre all together right so so it kind of all started with magic as as like the physical games back in like 1970s 80s, right like yeah exactly like granddaddies of of the of the actual gaming like the dungeons and dragon days and magic the gathering days where people used to assemble in these huge halls with thousand people participating in these fucking huge ass tournaments playing magic games and card games where on this thank god oh huh? sorry i can, you can swear on the stream right i was like i am going to get screamed <laughs> everybody's in our tent i swear a lot in my classes <laughs> so people are used to me calling like you know fuck 10 times in a sentence so cool so uh, so so far uh, yeah why don't you share uh, some more insights on how your experience has been on this specific project uh, i think now you've been working multiple years on this project and and i think one thing that essentially uh, lacks in at least the students perception right now the way i interact with our students right like they work on a lot of projects uh but they don't have a very holistic understanding of what really means when it comes to working in the industry right and because these projects span multiple years like last production game that i worked on was a five year game project right like it's still been in development even though i'm not working on it so so i think uh, just share your side of how how your journey has been on different phases of this project that has spanned multiple years and and what are kind of your key learnings there that you would like to share So fortunately on this project i have been there since pre production so i've been there since like the beginning of the whole project and the key thing which i have taken from this project is uh, sustainability so, so how you design your code and your tools tool set because tool set is what drives you forward like hmm. down the line lot of stuff which you have to do is has to be automated for designers and they don't have to basically contact the engineers for each thing hmm. so i would say making a general idea of how you want to design tools for the designers is how you go about architecting your code hmm. so start from a prototype so it has to start from the ground zero like it's we basically there is this concept called a marshmallow challenge where you keep on you have a stick and you keep on putting marshmallows on the stick and try to get it as to, as high as possible without it falling apart and you have to start one by one so it's an iterative process so you have to start from the basics get 
the smallest prototype going of what your vision is like of the game like depends on the game now see this is very much a, this could this what i'm describing is basically what can go for indie as well as triple a because uh, it all depends on the creative process where you are in pre production etc mm-hmm. so if if supposing in pre production they already have a concept their vision of what the actual gameplay systems are then you can go about prototyping but then outside of that you have mm-hmm. to also be like the the realist like the realist in the room basically because designers and artists can always look to engineers for like what how grounded a feature can be hmm. because in terms of creative creativity anything goes right like people can go nuts they want like something which is very which is not capable of probably on device on the hardware you are working with or like you don't have the like the people for it etc so you have to basically prioritize tasks and uh basically get an understanding of what is important for your game right now mm-hmm. like like for example a core feature versus a nice to have like mm-hmm. understanding the difference between the two is probably one thing which i found very useful mm-hmm. okay. over the long span of the project and tools is one thing which i like honestly speaking before joining uh seismic/niantic i did not understand how important it is because i was always think okay engineers we'll get the access from the art art artists and the designers and we just hook it up but then you realize we don't have the time for doing so much stuff so we have to allocate a lot of the stuff to the designers to the, often the producers like they also have to do some hard skills as well so you have to leave a lot of stuff in terms of tools like like serializable scriptable objects which you can just hook assets to which is one thing which i find very useful like leave everything which is design facing to the designers don't mm. always keep it like a private string inside a file in a class which only you have access to which in the long run will seem very wrong i guess and you'll be fucked every time the designer wants to change it <laughs> because you will have to change it yourself one thing which i found very useful is uh, in the two the two aspects to it one is with programmers which is you are able with programmers making your code readable uh, organizing very pro- organizing your code properly and making sure that everything is in modular so that in the long run is something somebody has to edit it they can don't have to make considerable changes to your code they can use it directly mm-hmm. the other aspect is with artists which where i'm mentioning like leaving stuff open providing them with tools like for example if they want to play a vfx somewhere and shoot it from there to another place you make a tool for them so that they don't have to bug you all the time for it so making small things like that and basically in order to become a better gameplay programmer i would say that the best thing you can do is try implementing small small features and start off start off zero make a small feature what do you what do you want and you don't have to make a game that's the thing like people always think that game dev is only making huge big pretty games of course when you are alone as a single pro, like a programmer who can't do very great art which is me <laughs> you have to work with whatever you got and you have to work with programmer art and uh, basically get features which have bit of punch to it like which have something which you can show to somebody which have like an inventory system which which is not even gameplay feature it's a more of a data based like data structure based than front end based so even small things like that is one thing which i find very useful like yeah I've, even during all my interviews i have had the opportunity of having like uh, my phone with me or my laptop with me so i have a habit of showing whatever i have via mm-hmm. github or via videos which i have Hmm. I think that's a very good point, right? Like I emphasize this is a lot as having a portfolio of things that you can showcase, right? Like demos and and live projects and things that you can talk meaningfully about in any interview, right? So so projects is something that we emphasize heavily as well. Um, so I, de- I definitely agree that this is something very important. Um, one thing you briefly mentioned was something regarding a marshmallow thingy. Uh, can you just uh, because i heard the same concept before uh, but it's coincidentally never come up on any other previous webinars so yeah can you just deep dive into what exactly it is and and so funnily know. i know why i'm smiling because it's actually from the etc which is my alumni which is our uh, alumni like uh, alma mater and mm-hmm. the thing with the concept is one of our classes during the uh, first year was the steam building exercises where you un- not only understand how you make games you understand like the social element of it let's just say uh, the soft as- soft skills aspect of it right right and as a team we had to build 
we were given sticks and we were given marshmallows and we were just told build like a tower uh, and we had, there were multiple teams like it was like a co-op competitive kind of situation where you had a team with you but you were competing with other teams as well and you had to build a tower with the marshmallows and the sticks as tall as you can and people are competing with each other people are trying as fast as possible to get it but they were not understanding that the core foundation is key so these are like many small hints at how you do like programming like don't rush a prototype fast try to build the foundation first mm-hmm. that's one thing which i got off from that uh, like kind of activity then trying iteratively like making a core feature like the foundation set and then building on top of it a second feature on top of that so keep on making a solid foundation so that in the end it doesn't all crumble up yeah so uh, the activity was kind of like a let's say it even though it was a, like a fun activity to do with like your teammates it taught us a very small like small hints at how you actually architect your code because it helps out in the long run because sustainability is one thing which i can i can't emphasize enough in game development because as you go testing becomes more and more difficult because you have more like different pathways in your game so qa is one thing which uh which is very important in game development because mm-hmm. that's where you find bugs and like what all you can improve upon and providing the qa with tools so that they can do so they don't have to something they need to test one thing which is 2 hours into a game they don't have to play the first 2 hours of the game they have to have hooks in the game where you they can go into this particular scene or they can go uh into a particular part of the game so that they can skip the whole part so small things like that is like we have mm-hmm. a tool for that which is like uh they, there's a whole part of the game if you want to skip and you want to trigger the reward so mm-hmm. the vfx wants to hook up the vfx to the rewards so he wants to see the rewards constantly right so we set up like a system for him so that he can constantly get the rewards so press a button to spawn the reward small things like that yeah yeah so i think that kind of brings us to our very first question so web was asking in the chat when you are talking about tools in the context of game development right like what do we actually mean by these tools and and that is pretty what you were touching on so i thought i would just pick that question now so can you just add a little bit more there so it's small things from like edited tools uh, like for example you have now let me let me come with a solid example one second uh, in, so in my particular game for example we have a vfx pipeline set up so that the vfx artists never have to contact the programmers they just are told like they in their vfx uh, creative meetings they have whatever they need to un- like understand on how to build a vfx they have four or five particular uh, uh, scripts which run particular like in in, in terms of an order so it's like a graph so mm-hmm. suppose they want to play uh, a vfx at a particular position and then in the middle of the screen want to like put up a pop up with more vfx on it so then we have particular scripts which uh play vfx at this position we have one of that we have shoot uh, vfx from this position to this position that's another one so small things like that so they don't have to con- constantly contact the programmers so that's just one thing off the top of my head which i've recently worked on mm-hmm. and you know other things like uh for animators for example they want uh tools which help them like uh, basically migrate their animations from their uh software into like unity or in the game engine and many and unity surprisingly did not have when we started the project we did not have support for that uh, in house so we had so we had to do it in, within our project outside of the unity code so i think one other example that i can think of as well like imagine if you're working on say candy crush right now you have 500 levels inside the game and if your designers wants to test you know some new kind of looking candy chocolate candy or something on level 322 right they're not going to hit play and go and finish all the levels directly and then be able to see how the actual new image of the chocolate candy looks in the game right like they want to be able to directly jump uh into this 300 whatever is the number of the level to quickly you know test out the things that they have made recent changes to so you have to build tools around the game logic itself that help you kind of you know navigate the space and and you need to build this tools for your designers that are working with you for artists that are creating the artwork for people like uh, in the qa department who are testing the game and finding bugs as well so 
if they find a specific bug on level 500, you know, and every time they have to reset the entire game, that you don't expect them to play all the way to level 500 in order to retry and produce that same bug again and find out what is exactly happening, right? Why is the game crashing there and things like that. So, so you need to build these sort of hacks, if think about it, right? Like these are nothing but hacks that only the development team has access to, so they can jump around different parts of the game and try to, you know, make sure everything is working fine and, and you know, things are working as they are kind of intended. So, so from an external person perspective as well, right? Like those are what essentially would refer to as sort of uh, tools in this context. Um, and tools is like a very vague term because it can yeah. range from like a small thing like an FPS counter, which is access for the dev hmm. teams where you can see frame drops whenever and provide necessary logs. So one thing which is also important is in core features, I would also rec highly recommend logging because whenever you have co like major game crashes, logs are your best help because you don't know what is going on. It could be an audio, like if you have heavy audio in your game, it could be an audio build crash, it could be anything. Mm -hmm. So always providing necessary logs in the core areas of your game are highly important because it helps QA, it helps you to figure out when a call stack is provided to you from QA and mm -hmm. what you're looking at and how to solve that problem. It mm -hmm. basically helps. It, the, all these tools which I'm talking about are just quality of life and nice to haves for you, which when you are as a programmer or like a QA person looking at it, you are smiling. You're not like, oh shit, I'm going to have to do this crap again. You're like, oh, it's a nice tool to have, which I can directly yeah. go to this part of the game, etc. Yeah. And a small thing, like I recently also worked on a time scale thing. Like artists wanted like to see their VFX and see their, uh, what they're working on in very slow motion so that they can make sure that it's animating correctly to like, the frame rate of our game. Mm -hmm. So we made like a small time scale tool, which basically allowed them on a toolbar to just move the game at a different pace. So mm -hmm. it, it like the, to, the term tool is very vague. It can be a small one hour, like amount of effort word tool to like a big tool, which is a, which hooks into the back end, hooks into your animation system, hooks into your uh, physics systems, etc. Yeah. yeah, I remember I once I made a tool actually uh, with a click of a button, it will go and start uh building an android apk in the cloud somewhere it will go and start building an ios version as well in parallel and it will kind of deploy the same thing onto the different google drive for the qa guys to install and then it'll do a bunch of shit but in the front it's just a single button in unity you click that button and bam but there's a lot of magic happening behind the scenes that's actually taking making this heavy duty work of, you know, building a game which can go on console, on PC, on Android, on iOS, all together and, and get it all running uh, very fast so that people don't have to waste their time. So so essentially that anything that kind of amps up productivity for people on your team um, can be kind of categorized as a tool. So, cool. And, so, essentially, and essentially custom game engines are collection of tools, like yeah. most game companies do not use the popular mainstream game engine. They have their own in-house game engine. Hmm. And it's all necessarily what you're talking about, like small buttons, which do magic. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So uh, like you mentioned briefly that you're from, you know, Velour Institute of Technology. Uh, we actually have a lot of students with us who are from BID. They might not be in this chat, but generally kind of connected with us as well. Um, uh, like, um, at least in my time in Delhi College of Engineering, there was no fucking thing related to game development. I had no idea. I was like, I still to this date, you know, uh, you know, say that at least if somebody would have told me when I was back in college, like I would have, you know, been been way ahead of time uh, when it comes to game development. But but we didn't have any exposure back then. Um, yeah. So so any specific reason why you kind of tran tran transition from you know. BIT and India specific and then moved to US and, and started working there. And, and how was the kind of that experience altogether? So like I mentioned, like until third year, I had probably no idea like what I was planning to do. And it was honestly speaking, games was kind of the only thing which I found interest in. And I was like, why not take a shot at it? And primarily the exposure to the, the gaming club within VIT was mm -hmm. probably the best, like, in terms of resource I had, because it, as all the VIT people on the stream probably know that like getting your hands on internet there is impossible because 
you have limited allocation of gbs you get is pretty old school uh, but anyway uh, so in terms of resources we had like a open source like folder which anybody could ha- have access to like different packages like different asset store assets which are very very important in terms of like if you're making like a, a even though you have to make a feature or a like a small product you're making you need a- assets like in terms of art and uh, other tools which you can't like make from the ground up because you need like help from other uh, asset store assets so that folder was primarily our what we all shared and i feel that resource was very useful in terms of my growth because reading code is one thing which i can't emphasize enough mm-hmm. as a tool set for all programmers because you can write code but uh, when you are working in a large code base reading code quickly and understanding how you can go from like not understanding this entire package at all to working with it and utilizing on utilizing it as well as writing code on top of it is what uh, is very very important for a programmer and especially gameplay programmers because like for example when you're working in animation for primarily as well as graphics for example uh, inverse kinematics which i worked with recently with my technical animator mm-hmm. there are a lot of overhead and methods on top of unity's system which is already there within for the animator which you can add on top to write code for it mm-hmm. you don't have to start from the ground up you they already have available tools you can just add on top of it and that was very useful for me because like even though i if i didn't have the experience reading code before in undergrad i wouldn't have easily been able to have that much progress in terms of reading code because as we all know undergrad like they, they teach us to write code but not read code because reading code is one thing which because the more concise it gets the more like people call this call con- concise code classy which i agree but it also becomes more difficult to visualize because one method is doing everything you have to look into the method understand what that method is doing etc so reading code is like the more i my one of my favorite shortcuts on my windows pc is f12 which is find usages in rider because that basically allows you to go down the rabbit hole and understand what is going on within yeah. this method yeah it's being utilized in different places etc so that it makes you understand like in bigger projects where like smaller projects you know what is going on in the game because you have primarily worked on all features but in bigger games you have to if you want to understand and utilize somebody else's code you have to understand what they are doing so instead of going and asking them all the time you can just go down the rabbit hole and understand what you're working with so code reading is one thing which i highly emphasize uh, and for me undergrad like now going back to the story i went down a different a <laughs> different rabbit hole <laughs> uh, i after after my experience with the gaming society i started making small prototypes even my final year project was actually made like a physical game boy like i worked with a guy in the ep department and he worked on the hardware and we made like a small led screen and i made like tetris i made snake all the basic pong all the basic games uh, in uh, java and embedded onto the hardware mm. so it it was a very in terms of programming it was a very basic thing but in, like it was more of the collaboration which helped because it gives you a long term understanding of programming sorry game programming is programming plus working with others it's not just people working in a basement together it's also understanding and having a rapport with other people because as the project gets bigger the more complicated the code base gets the more understanding you must have in terms of naming stand i'm just it's such a there's so many things like with program you have to have understanding on naming standards how you architect the code uh what kind of system you're using entity component system you're using uh, because entity component system is one thing which is very modular like going back to the previous thing which i talked about is modularity in a, in your project mm-hmm. and small things like that go a long way and that ha- exposure to that final project was helped me a lot and then i went into cmu which is the etc uh, department has very very important uh, and they emphasize a lot on working together in teams both in terms of a short term because we had like two week three week long project but we also had six month long project yeah so it teaches you both sides of the story because in two, we had a one week long project as well which was even more insane like so this one thing with the teacher which is called a vertical slice which is get a small minimal skeleton version of whatever stripped down version of whatever you are imagining out and 
in hands of people so they can start testing yeah yeah i remember the one week project you were talking about the lightning round right yeah <laughs> yeah fun yeah, fun stuff so actually one of uh, we kicked off a new game development batch just today and today only i had like a orientation session with the students and there were like about uh 30 odd students in that session um and and we were literally talking about just projects 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 everything in the entire program is just about projects 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 like and that kind of it reads the philosophy that we learned at cmu um you know that there is no amount of learning that can beat uh you know hands on experience when it comes to building shit right like it doesn't matter whether you're building games android apps websites whatever right like whatever is it that you love to do just build 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 because you'll stumble you'll fall but you know all those learnings are you know thousand times better than just going and sitting and reading books or blog posts and and just dreaming about it right so so just try to build small and incrementally kind of increase complexity there and and keep adding stuff pretty much i always describe like my road in game development as like learning how to play the guitar like it's going to start it's going to be start off painful as hell it's not going to be fun in between you think you're going to suck like you think you suck and then as you start getting better and better in between the intermediate phase comes in between where you start getting better and you the growth rate like spikes up Hmm. so exposure exposing yourself to different uh code like ways of coding and different tool sets one thing which i can't emphasize enough like i said is going on the asset store because hmm. there are many small features and prototypes out there which you can just read the code through and understand how they start like how they went from like nothing to that phase where they actually got to, to a polish phase that skeleton period is very very important because it and makes you understand how to get uh, a feature growing from the ground up because when you have nothing and getting something substantial that period is very frustrating i, I know many people find it very frustrating as game developers out there but that phase is like learning the guitar it's like you have to start do something get it going practice as much as you can and yeah. then you'll get it. absolutely i can't can't stress enough what you just said cool so i think uh, arpana asked a question sometime back uh, how's working at uh, what's like a work environment uh, while working at such a huge uh, studio or at least the umbrella studio of me and tech right like such a big company so how's the overall experience working at a bigger studio like that so for me it's a relative jump because my internship so i have started from like the bottom to the top i'm not one of those like my friends for example the internet sony the internet at ea and stuff and then they went on to some other company so they started off high i started off like at a startup two startups then i went to like a medium scale studio and then i went to niantic so i all i started on the ground up so for me in terms of work environment it has gotten more like uh like professional before it used to be like a startup environment or a school but it somehow even though niantic is very professional it has a very startup environment in terms of like personalities like people still are conversing they have fun with each other their activities we have uh, various fun stuff on the side but at the same time we have a respectable core hour 8 hour core hours setup where people work a lot and have like pipeline set up for each thing so that nobody's ever blocked on each thing like one thing which is very important is never being blocked like suppose somebody is blocked like an artist is blocked making sure you troubleshoot for them or if a programmer is blocked and they're blocked by something which you have done helping them out so that because in the long run one empty like if an a hand is just if supposing one of your uh, pair of hands is just sitting idly by doing nothing it's a loss for you in the end so you need to help them out and that's what i have found very useful is people are willing to help each other out like it's not like an environment you must know everything by default like they always scope to grow and understand what you are working on as well as the overall what the vision of the company is because your skill set might differ from what the company is uh, where the company is going towards so you have to stretch and bend your way towards that so understanding how, uh, the varying code base understanding the different changes in like how we are working the, like for the reason i'm saying saying all this is because we have had in the past many features which you have worked on but then had to be thrown away which can be very frustrating as a programmer but you know that it's one it's going to happen because in game development features are you cannot treat features like a baby you have to sometimes just get rid of them 
and understanding that is so small things like that is what made me grow as a programmer like understanding like game development is an iterative process where create the, the creative aspect of it can clobber over your technical aspect which is you making something it gets thrown away or you make something and it has to be changed drastically to fit design or fit art so, yeah so so normally i used to you know uh, when i used to talk to my my engineers that that was leading i would always recommend that you know treat game features that you're building as you are their uncles and aunts right like they're not your own children so it's fun to play with them for a while it's fun to sort of babysit them for a while but then if if they are not healthy for overall health of the game itself they'll got to get kicked out so so treat them as somebody else's child that you're having fun with right now but but after a while there is a chance that they might not make it and, and you'll have to live with it but so so one thing that you briefly touched on like you know your career started with a small startup and all the way to a mid sized company and now to uh, a, a relatively decent or a big sized company as well right so so if given the choice in an idealistic world right like this question is usually always on students mind right they hey should i choose a startup or should i choose a, a big company and who should i kind of focus my initial attention towards in order to get my career started so so what would your advice be there uh to any sort of aspiring game developers game developers or just generally any sort of software developers as well that's a pretty good question actually because i would say it probably depends on your priorities like if you have a specialization in mind like suppose you want to become a animation programmer or an audio programmer which is like a very specialized field within programming then i would say a bigger company is very important because like ea for example has an audio engineer position available mm-hmm. not many companies do that so if you have like a very specialized field then i would say bigger companies are your best bet but if you want to become like a jack of all trades where you are trying to become like a master in everything and trying to understand and absorb everything then i would say startup environment is more your of your speed because it allows you to take up everything because you have a lot of responsibilities as a startup at a startup hmm. so i would say it has both are very useful in terms of growing as a programmer because you must also have a specialized field like your favorite like kind of tasks which you like to work on like i love working on tools and working on gameplay systems but at the same time you must also have like understanding of different features like back end even i'm not particularly good at back end code but i still must understand because i've always worked with back end engineers with matchmaking for example and getting all that stuff working so mm-hmm. there's a lot of like programming as a whole there are a lot of like handshaking involved with different fields mm. so even though you want to work on certain parts you will have to inev- inevitably you'll be working with other parts of the uh, code base which you are not which you don't like so i would say in the long run i would say working at a startup is better but i can't choose it's like picking a favorite kid <laughs> yeah, yeah no i think i definitely agree so so normally it kind of comes down to uh, individuals perspective and how they they see their career as well and i think uh, the point you made is absolutely valid um but what i have seen is generally students since they are not yet exposed to the industry it is very hard for them to know that hey i want to be uh, you know a graphics pipeline programmer right or an audio programmer or a a vx engine optimizer or some shit very specific and niche right like it, it's really hard for students to kind of make that decision and that's why usually what i recommend is that um irrespective of whether you're going at a big company or a small company try and see who you will be working with right like do you have senior slash super senior engineers that you will be able to learn from i feel like that becomes a very important sort of aspect in the first four to five years of your career right uh, those core sort of uh, you know aspects shape up a lot of your career future career direction first four five years right and 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 if you have somebody really technical sharp brilliant kind of a person right or at least multiple people then now you have much better opportunity in understanding a lot of deeper aspects of a lot of different disciplines and and being at a startup will give you an advantage over a big company because you will have opportunity to explore a lot of different things and and you never know what kind of things might might uh, give you that excitement and that kick that you might have not never encountered before right a lot of people outright dismiss tools programming is like this is not even you know this is for people who are 
not good at game programming, right? Like those do tooth programming, but actually tooth programming is much more challenging and hard uh, because you are doing something auxiliary and it should be very productive and efficient and still not impact any kind of frame rates because it's part of the daily workflow and such. So, so you, people, once they start understanding tools programming, they start to love it just because it's so challenging, right? Like it pushes them to the edge of trying to do a lot of these things and, and then they're dying to take tasks for tools programming. So it's kind of like, you know, till, till you don't, till you haven't tasted it, you don't know how it's gonna taste actually, right? So, so I feel like startup is usually what I recommend just because it lets them explore a lot more in a very short amount of time. At bigger companies, you will get more sort of people to learn from, but it kind of is like, hey, if you end up working on a bigger project, you might end up working on that project just for two years in a very specific thing um, and might not give you the breadth of exposure that personally early on is usually helpful for students as well. So so that kind of adds value. Um, yeah, and for me, honestly speaking, like you touched upon a good topic that like the importance of having a lead, like I, for me personally speaking, like since I've come to Los Angeles, like working at Seismic, like my lead has been brilliant and like very important in my personal growth. So like if you have any person in your university for all the students out there who is like, like a rock star programmer, always try to absorb and take stuff, like techniques because keeping up, game programming is very much keeping up to date with modern technologies. Like because game, game programming touches three or other four fields. It has its hands in many jars. It touches upon graphics and modern graphics is evolving every day. Understanding animation, animation is evolving every day, and tech, even gameplay. Gameplay has changed so much over the last twenty. We started mm-hmm. went from Mario, like two D platformer phase, to like a fighting game phase, generation to big RPGs, and now we have. Then we had the whole Candy Crush. Like now we have mobile gaming. So it's all different phase because no, no game industry is not permanent. Like it evolves every day. So yeah. being as up to date with different what. Because game industry is also about what sells. It, it may be already a passion project, but it also is about what sells. So understanding what, how the gaming market is, understanding the gaming industry is also very important. Mm-hmm. So I would say keeping up to date with all these things is very important. Like yeah, yeah. Right. Lead, lead, lead is definitely one thing with, because you have ideas to bounce off of each other. You have a lot of stuff to talk about. That's awesome. very important. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, one thing that you just touched on is and kind of connects to the next question as well. That is like uh, Rishabh's asking, like, what is the main difference between gaming industry in India and in the US? I think uh, so that was like the clear differentiation. And you just mentioned something about the industry and what sells in the industry is also important, right? So, so, so what's your kind of take there on India versus US scene between gaming industry? Such a difficult question. <laughs> For me, honestly speaking, like Indian game, like that may hit may may hit a lot of nerves, but like the Indian gaming market, like is very much dependent on the mainstream. Like mm-hmm. when PUBG was popular, PUBG was popular. When Call of Duty was popular, Call of Duty was popular. Like we do not like we have a very small, hardcore community of indie game supporters in India, but we primarily are the of the mainstream. Like when anything which has come from the West, we play the mainstream game. We don't, like, I've not heard too many people play Limbo or Inside, for example, which <laughs> probably some have out there in the stream. Good, good for you guys. Uh, but for me, like, the difference is in India, the mainstream sells, while here, there are a lot of opportunities for, like, the smaller in- companies to jump out and pop out and become very popular. Like, CD Projekt Red, like, mm-hmm. The Witcher 3, the company was like very small indie studio with barely like any funding and it became like now it's probably the second most valued game company in Europe yesterday. Yeah. It's like it made such a big jump because it it sold and it knew what it wanted to sell and it started off as an indie game developer but it got where it want, became because of the, the the appeal of like RPGs in the West while yeah. in India I can't think of too many RPGs which many will play like Outside of maybe Blizzard games, which is Warcraft, many Warcraft fans out there probably. But I don't knew, I didn't know too many people in Age of Empires, for example. All these are like mainstream games if you think about it. Like not many of them play Warhammer, for example. Hmm. Like just wanted to. That's probably the difference. I think it's more about the tastes of games and the gamers. And also we haven't had too much backing in terms of like 
the society like in india many people still think that gaming is oh, all for kids while let let somebody else make it we'll just play it <laughs> yeah exactly so it's very much like if somebody somebody like personally speak even for me when i told many people oh, i'm going to gaming they were like it's a risky thing to do like it's by default a risky thing to do in india because it's very much a niche thing you're going down while in the us it's more accepted like i when i used to talk my to, to my friends in university and they told they were going to games i was like they were like their parents were like yeah that's good when i had to go through so much shit so i was like So I think that's the that kind of is the stark contrast between like India and the US that the perception of game development and gaming in general is very different. Mm-hmm. I feel it's gotten much 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 better. Like like you mentioned, like there are many people out there now who have like play Steam. Steam is the probably the best resource out there for playing different kinds of games, smaller company games, and uh, I feel that has helped a lot. Like in the last ten years, there's been a lot of good progress. i think yeah you're definitely right a lot of it is a function of uh, how uh, you know even the market is evolving right like what the indian gamers want naturally the companies will make those kind of games right like people are not going to make games uh, like limbo specifically for the indian market because then there isn't an audience that is willing to pay and of course you know even game developers need to uh earn a living and and pay rent and eat food so so it becomes hard to justify for companies to make these games but i think uh on the second point there are now a lot of bigger universities so we have a lot of students from um uh, ups university in dehradun and amity and lovely professional university a lot of these bigger names that have launched dedicated programs or at least you know uh these specializations where uh specific uh folks can enroll in to do say one elective course or two elective courses that are focused on game development as a career track right so a lot of these companies are starting to uh, sorry universities are starting to adopt these new age programs but there is still a limitation as to their like you know they don't have a uh, very well connected faculty to a certain extent as a result uh they're still teaching very outdated stuff uh, not really going hard deep into what exactly the industry wants so there are still disconnects there but i think now there is starting to like people and and especially our cultural wise like you know that adoption that people are getting okay with you know oh game development is a viable career option uh you know is is something that is starting to take shape it's slow it's definitely behind us and japan and a lot of the other pop bigger markets Uh, globally, but I think that shift is momentum is happening now. Right? Cool. So, Setu has another interesting question. Um, uh, so he's asking that is there any core difference between the skill sets that are required by big global companies and specifically that of sort of Indian companies? And if there are some special areas that uh, devs probably need to focus on when they're preparing for these companies. so honestly speaking it's a pretty good question but honestly speaking i can't comment on indian companies because I, funnily i have never worked in india outside of an internship i came from straight from undergrad so i can't really comment on what skill sets are required in indian companies but in terms of big global companies like gaming companies i would say probably how you can adapt and write 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 so writing code is not what no company looks for writing code because writing code is just bunch of syntax but how you get to the writing code aspect is what they mainly look at like how you are when you get a like when you get a problem to solve how you approach the problem how you you get your the facts how you organize your facts and how you deduce assum- make assumptions from that mm-hmm. is what is the most important thing like for example my one of my interviews they didn't even ask me uh, questions about coding they asked me electrical like circuit questions which is mm-hmm. like very much logic based questions no, nothing like you don't have to have a like you don't have to basically be a master of c++ or c sharp to understand like logic gates and stuff so that so people are now adapting like the game industry and most companies adapting their interviews and their hiring process to make sure they don't focus on their code it's more about the problem solving aspect and and how you deduce a problem is probably the thing which i have seen most interviews look out for like how you are approaching you may not even get the answer at the end it's like a 20 30, 30 minute interview and the questions keep may keep on piling up mm-hmm. but you may not get to at the end but how you have answered those questions and how you approach them is probably the most important thing i can 
Yeah, no, I definitely agree, right? You know, it's it, and and that's actually so. I'll add in on the India part. That's actually true, even in good companies here as well. When a good engineer or a senior engineer is taking your interview, most of the time they're not looking at the whether you know the answer or not, or not the answer, right? Like that's not what they're interested in. They're interested in if presented this problem, how do you start uh, thinking about the solution, right? Can you? Uh, talk while you are thinking about it and share your thoughts as well, right? So those are some of the key sort of aspects that they're normally looking at and not really whether can you get to an answer provided this as a solution because that's usually always like the least priority thing and, and coding is probably even below it, at least in a technical interview. They want to understand your uh, algorithmic thinking, their logical thinking and how do you, you know, your, your core concepts of data structures, can you apply the right kind of data structure to come to an actual solution and think of, you know, whether if I use data structure one or data structure two or data structure three, then what would happen in this problem or, or will it become better or worse? And can you debate basically? It's almost like a debate, right? Can you debate with yourself on different types of solutions and come to a better, uh, you know, solution within your own debate, right? So a lot of the time it's just back and forth communication and, and that's pretty much it all they're looking at. Uh, and at the end of the day, because coding and, and development is all about problem solving. Every day you're presented a task, which is nothing but a problem, and you gotta come up with a solution for it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, code and all should is something easily google level, right? Like out of, hardly everybody just Googles up everything that you don't need to remember and shit like that, so. And also one more thing which I would say not only for programmers, but game developers in general, I would say is ability to take feedback. Like one thing which many people are not capable of, which I've realized more you're exposed to people is when people criticize or give feedback, you should be able to bend, like what is good, you should be able to take it into consideration. What is bad, you may be able to filter out, but what is good, you must be able to absorb and make the proper changes up, like which you find appropriate to your code or to your art, etc. cetera. Like, yeah. Because I, I've got, like we have a review system in uh, most game companies in order to mm. get better. They have a review system where you put your code up for review or whatever feature you have worked on, put up for review. And it'll go through a review process where other engineers, designers, artists will look at it depending on what you're working on. And it goes through a full process before it goes into the uh, into your into your code base. And that has really, really helped me because when people give you feedback, it is not to put you down. It's overall improve the state of the code base on the health of and the readability of your code. So or your work or the other other stuff you worked on. Yeah, yeah. I would say taking feedback is one more thing which people should work on and having mm. like an uh, environment where you are working with other people is really helps. In that yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I think there's a very interesting question and I want to definitely dive into this one. So Rishabh is asking that, you know, uh, you talked about briefly about Limbo and, and Inside and these sort of unique slash interesting game. Why is it that, you know, majority of these fascinating games come from smaller teams and not uh, bigger commercial studios. So it, that's a very that's a very good question. Funnily, I think the ability to take risk is only taken by people who are like passionate, and passionate people I've noticed I've at least observed do not come in like huge groups. Like you cannot have like a thousand company uh, like a thousand people like company full of thousand people who are all passionate about the same thing. So, and about such risky things, for example, like, like stuff which may not be part of the mainstream. So mm -hmm. I've noticed like the only thing which drives people to get to such like risky, drive towards such risky games is uh, passion. And I would say, I would say that's not entirely true because certain games like Life is Strange that is published by Square Enix, which is a very big company, but it was developed by Don't Nod, which is a very small company, like in terms of they're pretty much indie developers. So I feel more public big companies are going out there in terms of publishing, but in terms of development, I would say still like the more creative, creatively risky uh, games are made by the smaller team. Yeah. But I feel publishers are now becoming aware of the, like the buzz and the hype which indie games create because of their unique and risky art style as well as gameplay. Mm. So I feel it's changing a bit, but I agree with mostly like it's always the smaller teams which go about it. Like No Man's Sky was made by like a team of seven or eight. Yeah. Like crazy if you think about it. Like 
and then sony came in and fucked it up <laughs> <laughs> like, even which even uh, cd project red was like 80 people i think when they made witcher 2 and now they when they made witcher 3 it became much bigger but yeah. like most companies like who create these insane games you'll be surprised like they have a small team but they are like all very very solid on their foundations and their skill set is very diverse that they can work on many things and get all of them solid so there was this one game i remember on steam again called grow home um and it was a very small studio uh, i forgot how many people but I, i remember it was a small studio even though it was part of ubisoft which is a mammoth in in size in terms of size of the company right but but the studio that made grow home which was a very experimental kind of a game in itself uh, was a very small team as well so so usually i think uh, you hit the nail on the head that risk is a big factor right so rishav if you think about it uh, if you are a thousand man company you have thousand people working with you you know your your ceo will never take decisions like hey let's go out and make this really risky game if it sells really well then great if it doesn't then all thousand people are out of jobs now right so it's just a function of when you are big you don't take risky bets when you're small uh, you don't have much to lose right so so that's why and, and the same philosophy applies for startups as well right like smaller startups come out of nowhere and and you know take business right out of uh, bigger companies and eventually you know bigger companies have no option but to go out and buy the smaller startups right if they want to still live uh, it's purely because bigger companies just don't have the appetite because they have a lot to lose if things don't work out uh they have to take care of the people that are working at these companies etc as well right so it's just a function of how big you are the bigger you are the slower you become kind of in terms of risk making but then a lot of bigger companies are now understanding this and taking risk on smaller levels so uh i've seen bigger companies that break off you know uh, inside a thousand man company there might be 10 small teams that are working on 10 different projects and these would be like three or four people teams so if one team fails on whatever they're working on the impact is very small but if they succeed now they can put in more team players and start building this team up as to whatever is the scope and need for this particular project right so a lot of bigger companies especially google and facebook and these kind of companies they are uh, you know aware of the challenges that startups are going to come and start eating their business because they are going to have to evolve as well right so and the same thing happens in gaming companies especially as well so if you look at uh, supercell they have a lot of small teams that keep iterating and keep building other games in parallel and eventually you know uh, these games keep getting killed off at different stages if supercell is not liking how they're going but then after that one game suddenly you know reaches that alpha or beta stage where it's getting good reviews and everything and they add more resources to it and then you know make it go public so so a lot of companies are trying to ex- adapt the strategy both in gaming and non gaming space um so i think we are just about out of time so we'll just take one more question um webhub is asking are there any uh top blogs slash communities that uh, you would request uh, or you know uh, suggested for aspiring game developers to follow along etc not i like so as part of like my one of my courses in cmu like every week we used to basically subscribe to these blogs and read weekly blogs basically about game design as well as gameplay programming and like i can't think of specific blogs which off the top of my head but i can provide like in the future i can't give it right now the links but i can provide in the future like sure yeah just send it to me and i'll circulate it on at least on discord and all so i remember like certain ones were very interesting because many of these are like pla- like platform like platform in terms of hardware as well as mm-hmm. uh, genre dependent like many of these blogs like very specific to like 3d platformers or uh, you want know, to make like a, a sandbox game for example like small things like these how they design principles how they approached it in terms of architecting their code or there are arts eva had many art based blogs as well so i can provide you with the necessary links yeah so i think one the few ones that i can think of are definitely gdc oriented so gdc that happens in san francisco and then the india version of it igdc um they both have really good blogs and and in gdc specifically the one in san francisco uh, you have this section called gdc vault 
which has a bunch of recordings from uh, GDC that happens. Usually they come into the vault one year after, but they still are very uh, resourceful, both from tech, design, postmortems, art analysis, and all those kind of things, right? So you should definitely uh, subscribe to those because you know you keep getting a lot of valuable resources from a lot of these popular games and how they were made and. Um, sometimes you'll have lead engineers presenting, you know, the entire technical architecture of the game and how they implemented it, and even complex multiplayer games as well. So, so those are some of, you know, uh, when it comes to gaming specific, I would definitely recommend that you follow these two, the India Games GDC uh, channel. So, I, you can just Google IGDC, or you can just Google GDC Vault, and and the Vault link will show up. I think now they have created a YouTube channel as well where they keep uploading uh, older videos on GDC Vault as well. So you don't have to log into the Vault website, but you can directly subscribe to the YouTube channel and, and they have a lot of good resources. So as part of our actual course curriculum, there are a few places where I recommend certain specific videos. And one of them is about the Pokemon Go's architecture uh, that uses dependency injection and a lot of fancy other shit. Um, so, so that one is one of my favorites as well. And, and I usually at the very tail end of the course, once we have covered pretty much everything, that's one of the things that I usually recommend to a lot of students to go and check out. Um, so cool. So I think we're just running out of time. So any sort of other uh, sort of feedback slash suggestions for students and, and folks who are trying to aspire to be game developers, anything kind of closing off comments around that? Uh, I would just say keep doing like, Try to keep yourself occupied with some small feature. Like, doesn't have to be one feature. It can be like, you basically can be one feature and take it one step at a time. You don't have to like constantly be working on different things. You can make one feature, polish it, get it working with another feature. For example, like I had worked on like a game, like in my third semester of my university, I worked on a game engine and I started off just rendering us like a cube. Then it went from that to rendering like different uh, mesh meshes and uh, rendering textures along with it. And went from there to like getting a, pro a proper animation pipeline going where I had four of our animating models on the screen. So mm -hmm. it starts off very low and then you can just keep on incrementing on top of it. And in the end, using that same game engine, I made a 2D shooter. So you can, you can start off slow and you have plenty of time like for most people out there, I hope. Like, so you don't have to rush yourself because in the end, quality is what matters, not quantity. Because hmm. most companies look at your what you have and look at the quality of it. Like, if it's up there in terms of like readability, like GitHub is one thing which I would highly recommend. Yeah. Like having your code ready immediately for people to access and read and look through what, how how your mind works is very very important and also helps in terms of having like an organized portfolio because you can. On the your GitHub splash page, put like a link. You can put different hmm. media marketing uh, stuff, all that. So I would say getting yourself out there is the most important thing, along with whatever hard skills you have. Yeah, GitHub is literally like the first thing I swear by. I did a dedicated webinar eight months, nine months back, just on GitHub. That's it. Like no other thing, just GitHub. And and when we kick off our batch, like the first task that people have to do in their orientation is create a GitHub create a new repository, create a branch, create a pull request, submit it. Uh, so, so it's so damn essential these days that you can show up to an interview without a resume, but don't show up without a GitHub. Uh, like that's literally what I, 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 you know, I am an extremist when it comes to uh, being able to present your projects and present your work. Uh, your GitHub speaks a thousand words. Uh, you know, more than your resume. So, so cool. So awesome having you uh, uh, on the call. And, and I really appreciate you taking out the time. Uh, I know it's pretty early for you. So uh, thanks for, you know, uh, spending time with us. Uh, this video will get like it's been recorded. So it will go up on YouTube sometime in some time next week. So it, I'll share it with the students. I'll share a copy with you as well. Feel free to check it out. And, and, you know, uh, feel free to drop by anytime in the community as well on Discord. I'm sure a lot of folks here will be excited to chat. Uh, yeah. I, I love interacting with like and answering questions because I, I knew I, I was there once, like where these guys are, all of you. Like I know I was there once in that stage where you don't know where you're going, there's uncertainty. It's always nice to get a question answered. 
Yeah, yeah, perfect. Cool. So thanks guys for staying. I know it's Saturday and it's pretty late. It's almost midnight here. So uh, thanks everyone for sticking around and and thanks Milan for also joining us. Uh, it was lovely having you on and hopefully we'll we'll do this on a very regular frequency as well and then yeah, sure. Sessions. All right, cool. Take care everyone. See you guys. Bye. Bye.